Chapter 16 Boon Marry all five of you, my father sputtered. How can you, prince of a noble house, suggest such a heinous act? In the throne room the air throbbed with tension. My father and three sat on golden thrones. The five Pandavas sat across from them on silver seats to remind them that they were honored guests but less powerful. In a corner behind an embroidered curtain, Kunti and I sat on chairs of sandalwood. I had graciously offered her the larger one. She had accepted with a slight frown, not sure if my action was respect or reuse. But the size of a seat has little to do with the power of the person who occupies it. We all knew this. Earlier in the day, Dri had arrived with palanquins and musicians to take us to the palace. It had indeed been him at the window last night. He and his men had been scouring the city for me. He brought robes and jewels and horses, fine weapons that brought a gleam to the brothers' eyes and an invitation from King Drupad, who wanted to celebrate his daughter's marriage, which had been so hasty and unsatisfying, with a grand banquet where he could show off his new son-in-law. We are delighted to have gained the Pandavas as our relatives, Dri said with an elegant bow. I tried to catch his eye to indicate that I was less than delighted, but he was busy being gracious. He loved courtesies and had had little occasion to practice them. The brothers looked relieved at having to shed their disguise. On the way to the palace, their kingly robes cast a glow on their faces. Even I had to admit that they rode like gods. Admittedly, this is an unusual arrangement. But how can it be heinous to obey one's mother? Yudhishthir asked. Haven't our scriptures declared? The father is equal to heaven, but the mother is greater? Not many men would have been able to make such statements sound convincing. But somehow, Yudhishthir succeeded. Perhaps it was because we could see that he believed what he said. If we can't agree, he continued calmly, that Panchali should marry all five of us, then we brothers must take our leave, returning your daughter to your care. I stared at him in outraged shock. King Drupad stiffened and my brother's hand fisted around the hilt of his sword. To be sent back to her father's house was the worst disgrace a woman could face. When she was a woman of a noble house, such an insult could lead to a blood feud between the families. Was Yudhishthir oblivious of the danger in which his words had thrust the Pandavas? You can't do that, Dri exclaimed angrily. My sister's life would be ruined. Arjun's eyes flew to his brother's face. His jaw was tense. He disagreed with Yudhishthir. I could see that but out of respect for his brother, or perhaps because he knew that they had to stand together in this, he said nothing. I was disappointed, but in the pragmatic light of day, I didn't blame him as much as I had last night. 
Family loyalty was what had saved the Pandavas all these precarious years. How could I expect him to give it up for a woman he hadn't met until yesterday? To say nothing of the reputation of the royal house of Panchal, my father added, Draupadi would most likely have to take her own life, and then we'd have to hunt you down and kill you in revenge. The choice is yours, Yudhishthir said, without heat. Was the calmness a facade, or was he truly unshakable in the face of threats? An honourable life for the princess as a daughter-in-law of Hastinapur, or a death you force upon her. Honourable, blustered my father. Perhaps in Hastinapur such behaviours considered honourable. But here, in Kampilya, men will call Draupadi a whore, and if I should hand her over to the five of you, what will they call me? Perhaps death is a better alternative. I didn't fear the fate they imagined for me. I had no intention of committing honourable self-immolation. I had other plans for my life, but I was distressed by the coldness with which my father and my potential husband discussed my options, thinking only of how these acts would benefit or harm them. My brother protested hotly, but they brushed his youthful words aside. Why didn't Arjun speak up in my defence? Surely, now that they were considering my possible death, he should have felt some responsibility, some tenderness. Ah, Karna, was this my punishment for having treated you so cruelly? And where was Krishna, whose ill advice had lured me to this moment? The rest of the Pandavas, stolid in their silence, didn't seem to care about what became of me. In this assumption, I was wrong. One of them had already begun to fall in love with me. Later, he would tell me, I thought my chest would burst from the effort of holding in my angry words. If it had gone any further, I would have stood against my brother for your sake, even if it made me traitor to my clan. But in my agitated preoccupation with Arjun, I was blind to this. While the men negotiated, my father furiously, Yudhishthir with nonchalance, I examined Kunti from under my veil. I wasn't required to wear a veil in my father's house, but it had its uses. A small, triumphant smile flickered on her lips when she heard Yudhishthir quoting the scriptures in praise of motherhood. But a tell-tale artery pulsed in her throat. The Pandavas hiding as they had been from Duryodhan's long and lethal reach, had much to gain by forming an alliance with the powerful Drupad. They had everything to lose if they angered him. Knowing this, why hadn't Kunti laughed off her remark as a mistake and allowed the marriage to stand as it was? I didn't believe her claim that everything she said had to come true, or her honour would be lost. Something else was at work here, something I'd have to puzzle out. My father's eyes were the first to fall. I'll send word to Vyasa, wisest of the wise, he muttered. He knows the future as well as the past. We'll abide by his advice. 
Yudhishthir graciously acceded. Kunti wiped a tiny bead of sweat from her temple. The Pandavas retired to their quarters. I retreated to my bedroom, pleading a headache to escape Dhaima's eager queries about my bridal night. Vyasa sent a prompt verdict. I was to be married to all five brothers. My father was not to distress himself about how this would affect his reputation. This never-before-seen marital arrangement would make him more famous than a heap of battle victories. If people asked uncomfortable questions, he could blame it on the gods who had ordained it lifetimes ago. To keep my chaste and foster harmony in the Pandava household, Vyasa designed a special code of marital conduct for us. I would be wife to each brother for a year at a time, from oldest to youngest, consecutively. During that year, the other brothers were to keep their eyes lowered when speaking to me. Better if they didn't speak at all. They were not to touch me, not even the tips of my fingers. If they intruded upon our privacy when my husband and I were together, they were to be banished for a year from the household. In a postscript, he added that he would give me a boon to balance the one that had landed me with five spouses. Each time I went to a new brother, I'd be a virgin again. I can't say I was surprised by Vyasa's verdict. Hadn't his spirits threatened me with such a fate years ago? But now that it was to become an imminent reality, I was surprised at how angry it made me feel and how helpless. Though Dhaima tried to console me by saying that finally I had the freedom men had had for centuries, my situation was very different from that of a man with several wives. Unlike him, I had no choice as to whom I slept with and when. Like a communal drinking cup, I would be passed from hand to hand, whether I wanted it or not. Nor was I particularly delighted by the virginity boon, which seemed designed more for my husband's benefit than mine. That seemed to be the nature of boons given to women. They were handed to us like presents we hadn't quite wanted. Had Kunti felt the same way when she was told that the gods would be happy to impregnate her? For a moment, sympathy twinged through me. Then, it was lost beneath a surge of resentment. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't be in this miserable situation. If the sage had cared to inquire, I'd have requested the gift of forgetting, so that when I went to each brother, I'd be free of the memory of the previous one. And, along with that, I'd have requested that Arjun be my first husband. He was the only one of the Pandavas I felt I could have fallen in love with. If he had loved me back, I might have been able to push aside my regrets about Karna and find some semblance of happiness. I was married to the four other Pandavas, one after the other, in a long-drawn, tedious ceremony. I put my hands into each man's as the priest chanted the appropriate mantras and scattered yellow rice over us. 
A part of my mind noted the slight differences. Yudhishthir's palm was the softest. Bhim's was calloused from wielding the mace, which I had learned was his favorite weapon, and it trembled in mine, surprising me. Nakul's hands were scented with musk. Sahadev's had an ink smudge in the middle finger of his right hand. I tried, not too successfully, to read these clues. It struck me that during our hasty ceremony at the Swayambur, there had been no opportunity for Arjun and me to hold each other's hands. The irony of that made me want to find Arjun, to see what he was doing, angling my face discreetly under my veil. I discovered him sitting off to one side, staring deliberately into the distance as though he refused to be part of the festivities. I was shaken by the bitter downturn of his mouth. I hadn't expected him to care so much about the fact that I didn't belong to him alone. I must have made an involuntary movement for he swiveled his head to look at me. His eyes were angry, as though I were the one who had chosen to marry his brothers and thus betrayed him. I lifted my veil and stared back, uncaring of what his brothers might think of my indecorous behavior. I had to send Arjun a message and knew this might be my last chance in a long time. According to Vyasa's dictum, we wouldn't even be able to speak privately to each other for the next two years. I was desperate to make him realize that this situation wasn't any more to my liking than his. That he kept in his mind. Through the next two years, what we had shared, frail though it was, that moment of tenderness on the road, his gentle hands on my injured feet. Only then could I hope to salvage our fledgling relationship. I'll be waiting for you, I tried to tell him with my eyes, but he averted his gaze. My heart sank as I saw that he had made me the target of the frustrated rage that he couldn't express toward his brothers or his mother. I blamed Kunti for this development. She knew her son's psychology. If he couldn't have me all to himself, he didn't want me at all. He would go through the motions of marriage but he would keep his heart from me. And wasn't that exactly what she intended? Afterward, Dhri tactfully whisked the four younger brothers off to a tiger hunt. My father sent opulent wedding announcements to everyone he knew, and Yudhishthir moved into my palace. I went to him reluctantly still brooding over Arjun's unfair anger. But perhaps my own situation made me more patient with my husband than I would have been otherwise. When he made overtures of tenderness, I stopped myself from turning away. I would not make him the victim of my disappointment. I told myself. Kind, courteous, and well-read, he was easy to get along with, though I found him somewhat lacking in humor. Only later would I discover other facets, his stubbornness, his obsession with truth, his insistent moralizing, his implacable goodness. In bed, to my amused surprise, 
He was shy and easily alarmed. Slowly I realized that he had in his head a compendium of ideas. Had Kunti put them there? About what constituted ladylike sexual behavior? And this was a longer list. What didn't? I could see that I'd have to dedicate significant energy to re-educating him. It was going to be a long year.